When I was young, my grandmother had a collection of salt and pepper shakers. It seemed like every time I would go to her house, that collection would grow. There were the ones that looked like, you know, the mixer, the little street sweeper. My absolute favorite was the little dog that was peeing on the fire hydrant. <laughs> and, you know, from a very young age, what I realized was that these were not toys. These were not things that my cousins and I could pick up and play with. But I was also struck by the fact that we never actually used these to put salt and pepper on the meals that we ate. These were just the things that my grandmother chose, or perhaps they were gifted to her. Um, but, you know, now as I think of my grandmother, and maybe as you think of yours, it's hard to separate these, these people that we love without considering the things that they surrounded themselves with. So, 2007, I'm in a room with a group of teenagers, and we're staring at something that I had recently made. Now, these particular teenagers were all second-generation immigrants, primarily from Southeast Asia, so Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam. And uh, at the time, I was in grad school, and I was studying industrial design. I was curious to know how design might be used to address social issues. And while this was not a new thing for design, it was certainly a new thing for me. I was particularly interested to know, is it possible, or was it possible, for design to facilitate conversations between first-generation and second-generation immigrants, teenagers and their parents. So back to this particular day, I placed this object in front of the students. But we have to rewind a little bit. So the previous week, we were getting ready to have a workshop. I had been volunteering with these students for about nine months, and um, we were about to start a session, and I heard the students talking to one another and, and just sort of casually throwing out stereotypes about people in their community. Um, and I realized, you know, okay, I'm the adult in the room, and we have to address this. And so I said, hey, you know, there's, this, this isn't right. We, we shouldn't be using these kinds of stereotypes to talk about people in our communities. And they assured me, no, Tom, it's cool. Um, these, we have friends from these communities. We're, it's okay. It's, it's fine. And I knew in my heart it wasn't, yet we couldn't really get to the conversation I was hoping we might have around this topic. So that night, I went back to my studio, and I thought a lot about that conversation. I thought a lot about, uh, you know, is it okay just to, to accept that this is what's going to happen? And so I made this thing. This is like a very strange sort of thing. But what this thing was to me was a mashup of not only a skateboard, which the students also, you know, oftentimes came in with a skateboard under their arms, but a lot of this sort of like classic Chinese iconography from your favorite Chinese restaurants, or if you did a Google search on traditional Chinese hardware, I just put all these things together. And the following week, I brought it back, and I put it in front of these students, and we just looked at it. <laughs> and they were like, what is this? And I, I began this conversation by saying, well, what would it mean if somebody designed something for you and they didn't know anything about you? You know, what kind of conversations would we have then? You know, what does it mean if someone's just assuming things about you? It could be really offensive. You could create something that has no actual representation uh, or meaning for the people they're designing for. So suddenly, the, the conversation that I wanted to have the week before, we were having it today because I made this sort of strange thing. And that's the thing about objects. I mean, objects resonate with us for sometimes deeply personal reasons, and sometimes they're even hard to explain. You know, we're drawn to the way something looks, or the way it feels, or just the materiality. And, you know, in many cases, uh, it, it's just, it's hard to explain. I just like this thing. So my, my whole career, the thread through the work that I've done, has been about making objects. And so sometimes these objects serve a very specific function. Sometimes they help us speculate about possible futures. Sometimes they're just made to enjoy. You'll never forget your first nuclear weapon summit. That's, <laughs> that's a sentence I like to just throw out there once in a while. Um, four years ago, I was not only invited to attend a nuclear weapon summit, but I was asked to help facilitate it. Now, this particular weapon summit was a little bit different and I've been to a few. 
And for this particular one, there would be a, a range of attendees from national security experts to nuclear physicists, policymakers, technologists, you name it. People who don't normally have conversations in the same room. Everyone's very siloed. And so what we wanted to do for this particular event was to get all of these different perspectives and, and points of view to imagine how are we together going to reduce the threats posed by nuclear weapons. I understood that my challenge as the sort of creative person was to frame this in a way that would be a little out of the ordinary. So my team and I decided that we were going to, to make special little boxes and send them in advance to every attendee of the conference. Inside that box was a small little card with an invitation. Send a gift to 2045. So 2045 would be the 100-year anniversary of the first bomb that we dropped, okay? So what do you want to see for your future? I didn't know how this was going to play out. The conference starts, and soon I start to see people walking into the room. Everybody had boxes under their arms. I was relieved. I was like, oh, God, they did it. So people had their boxes. And when they found out that I was the guy who was sort of in charge of this, they said, when are we going to share the boxes? When do we do the boxes? There was an anticipation that I was, I was like, actually very surprised about. So when we finally had the opportunity to get people into small groups to share the contents of those boxes, and this is an important part of the story, People in this conference had very different views about our national security and what makes us safe. So they had very impressive titles from very different organizations. As they began to open the contents of their boxes and share their stories, those titles and those organizations, they started to fade away. And pretty soon, we were all just humans. So one participant had a Black Lives Matter t-shirt in hopes that this would just be a relic that we'd need to explain. Another had a family heirloom or a pair of baby shoes. One of my favorites was this piece of the Berlin Wall and a story about you know, never thinking that this would be removed in someone's lifetime. So what I loved about this was that all of these different perspectives suddenly are talking about you know, not what divides us, but what we have in common, our shared visions for a peaceful future. And I also just like this element of surprise, you know? So when was the last time we were actually surprised when someone opened a box in front of you and said, I want to show you this thing, and this is what I'm thinking about the future? There was something disarming and really just amazing about that experience. So since then, I continued to be invited to a range of uh, different opportunities. Um, with the U.S. military, the International Atomic Energy Agency. I'm currently working with the U.S. National Labs. And I get to do different talks and presentations and, and workshops. And um, you have these strange sort of pictures like this, where... <laughs> uh, when, I don't know if any of you ever watched Sesame Street, but there was this great song about one of these things does not belong. <laughs> Yeah, generally in the room, that's me. So uh, yes, there's always this you know, major case of imposter syndrome. Um, but but the, the, the real point is that there is an acknowledgment that in order for these organizations to take on the challenges that this world is facing, it's going to take something different. It's going to take a new approach, and it's going to take a little creativity. Now, I will say that these invitations don't come without hesitation or even downright skepticism. You know, there's a lot of crossed arms and people sort of like on their phones ready to tweet that this is just, you know, a bunch of BS. But in fact, uh, we do have these important conversations about what it means to use creativity. In one particular case at a, a safeguard symposium, after I had given a talk, uh, a participant stood up and he said, interesting talk. But how do you expect us to take the type of risks that you're proposing when the stakes are so high, given the nature of the work that we do? At that moment, I, I kind of wanted to just sink in my chair and disappear. But you realize that if you can't answer why you're in the room, you're not going to be invited very often in the future. And so I thought about it for a few minutes. And I, and I said, well, there's, there's two things. First, 
you can take risks when the stakes are much lower. You can take risks in how you put together a presentation, which was a slight dig on the <laughs> their presentations, which were sometimes kind of overly academic. Um, but you can also take a risk in how you facilitate a meeting. You can take a risk in how you inspire people to think about things differently, and perhaps the, the outcomes might be surprising and totally new. And the second thing is that if you want to have creativity in your organization, it's an investment. You can't just have one workshop or one consultant come in and think that suddenly you're gonna change the culture. You have to be totally willing to fail and try it again and take risks and do things that are gonna be a little uncomfortable. So, now let's come around to about a month and a half ago. So, I'm a teacher and I asked my students I want you to find a measurement tool. I want you to investigate it, study the history of it, and then I want you to replicate that measurement tool. I brought in a retired colleague of mine who had this amazing collection of clocks and watches and compasses, uh, you know, measurement tools of all types. And the students were fascinated. They were, they were you know, looking at all of these things and asking questions, and he was telling stories about where he discovered these, these different beautiful objects. And so then it was their turn to identify their own measurement tool and recreate it. One particular student chose a set of machinist calipers, you know, very precise tool uh, used in metalworking shops and whatnot. And she studied it, she drew it, she remade it using a laser cutter, and then she kind of disappeared. I didn't know what she was gonna do next. So the next part of our project was to design a new measurement tool to measure something that would be difficult to measure or intangible. Students came in to present their projects and this particular student showed a presentation that I would have never expected and it started with those calipers that she investigated and it quickly moved to a story about anthropometrics and eugenics and the use of tools to measure people and to measure how they're different, and to measure how we can be placed in categories of normal or other. You know, and in some of her illustrations, she even included a brown paper bag and a pencil, which you can measure the tone of your skin against the paper bag, or you can stick the pencil in your hair, and if it stays or if it falls out, that means something. And those were lessons that I had never heard about before. So when you assign projects to students, you never really know what to expect, you know, especially in design school. The power of the students' work engaged the class in ways that uh, were so incredible. So we all started from a similar thing, a similar object, a measurement tool or a pencil, but suddenly we have very different associations. A pencil to one person is empowerment or education and a pencil to someone else might be discrimination or judgment. So the thing about objects, the thing about things, I tell my students, if you have an idea that you wanna to talk to me about, do not come empty-handed. Come with a thing. Starting with the thing allowed national security experts to focus on not what was different, but what was in common what we had in common about our future. Starting with a thing allowed teenagers to talk about stereotypes and assumptions. So, you know, the teacher in me wants to encourage you guys all to go out and make your own things. But that's not really what this is about. This is about being creative. So the next time you're faced with that proverbial blank page, that intimidating blank page, or you wanna share a new idea, whether it's at work, or just at the Thanksgiving table. Take that small little risk, select a meaningful object, and start your story with a thing. Thank you. <laughs>